to the podcast where together, every Monday, we explore hospitality in its very broader sense. From culture and cooking, cocktails and coffee, nutrition and farming, politics and animal welfare, organic and sustainability, family and business, entrepreneurship, and much, much more. Come and learn with me, Mark Cribb, about where our food and our drink comes from, and the businesses and more importantly the human beings that thrive on where we decide to spend our time and our money. Sign up to our weekly newsletter at humansofhospitality.co.uk and hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice. Welcome to the now bi-weekly podcast and I'm releasing this on Monday the 19th of April, one week after the opening of outdoor hospitality, uh, at least in England. And I actually drove through a pretty severe snowstorm on Monday which made me laugh and cry in equal measure. Eating outdoors in the month famous for April showers was always going to be challenging but I certainly was not expecting snow on the very first day. But overall, operators I've spoken to certainly seem to have had a decent week. It's been chilly but dry and consumer demand seems very strong. Infection rates seem to be holding out. So hopefully in four weeks time or maybe even sooner if Sasha Lord keeps hassling the government for us, we can fully open the doors. Anyway, good luck to you if you are in the industry. Now, on to this week's guest, and less so someone's journey through hospitality this week, and more so a deep dive into a topic that I hope will be useful. Today I'm chatting to Victoria Searle, founder of DataHer, Hawks. Uh, And I'm fairly techy, and I found it frustrating over the years seeing the potential of data in the hospitality sector. Clearly, unlike, for example, selling double glazing, we operate in a social space where people often want to hear from us, where they're happy to take photos and share them to social media, where they're happy to check in and arrange to meet friends, and whereby perhaps sharing data on things like birthdays or dietary preferences or working patterns to help fill quieter times of the week are all things the customer is happy to share since they actually want to hang out with us. So with a potential positive relationship with data, the consumer and the business, I wanted to explore what is now actually possible. Is it easy? Is it hard? Are we doing all we can? What sort of things should we be doing with the information we collate? These are the sort of things I wanted to explore with Victoria. Now, Victoria has held a number of senior marketing positions in well-known brands, as well as an operational career in hospitality. But we'll cover all of that shortly in our conversation. And I'd also love to know your experiences, any apps or software you're using to help you in this area of your business. Or as a consumer, what do you feel comfortable sharing and how would you like to see venues using your information? So if you have any thoughts, do get in touch via the contact form on the website humansofhospitality.co. UK. And that's also a great place to support the podcast financially by becoming a patron or making a one-off donation via PayPal. Even the odd fiver just to buy me a thank you beer is appreciated and saves me going out and getting this podcast sponsored. Okay, thank you so much and I hope you enjoy the show. Victoria Searle, founder and head hawk of Data Hawks. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast this morning. Really appreciate you sparing the time. Can you just explain where in the world are you this morning, Victoria? I'm in a very sunny southeast London um, and I'm in my kitchen just looking out the window and a really bright blue sky for a change. Yeah, a bit different to yesterday. It was horrendous down here yesterday. I'm not too far away from the beach and uh, we got absolutely battered by a huge storm, but nice. Uh, If you're in London, presumably you're not overlooking... I don't know, you know, lush fields of, of cows then, like some of these podcasts <laughs> I do with farmers. Are you are you pretty busy location? Or? Um yeah, well I'm I'm in suburbia, but you know, it's London, so it's it's always gonna be pretty busy. But um there's usually a fox that kind of hangs around outside the back. Um but all I've got this morning is the neighborhood cat who's uh, waiting patiently at the cat flap to come in and steal my cat's food. Excellent. Just giving you those little eyes through the clap for that. Well, good. Thank you so much. So um, you've had an interesting kind of, you know, journey in hospitality, and I'm really excited to get stuck into a conversation around data today, because I think it's, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's just (laughs) genuinely uh, fascinating and timely, I guess. Um, You've had a challenging start because you started the business only about 18 months ago. So I guess you've traded more in lockdown than out of lockdown. But just to give people listening some context, can you explain a little bit about the latter part of your career before you started 
data hawks, which we'll come into, because you've got some pretty extensive experience in marketing roles in some pretty well known hospitality companies. So, yeah, what were you doing before data hawks? Yeah, well, I mean, I'd, I'd spent a good sort of probably 15, 18 years in, um, in operations and I'd moved into marketing. And prior to data hawks, I'd be marketing director at some incredible brands, you know, Cafe Rouge, TGI Fridays, All Star Lanes, and, and then Byron. And then about 18 months ago, I got the idea that, you know, I really wanted to do something with data and I just really wanted people to take marketing seriously. And um, and I saw that other industries were really using their data and I realized that, you know, we're probably 25 years behind even our closest cousins in retail. And I just thought there must be a way to use data to help hospitality operators drive acquisition of new customers, drive conversion and drive retention. And so Data Hawks was founded. Yeah, amazing. And and was this then was this an idea that evolved as you were in those sort of senior marketing positions? Was this was this an evolution of lots of the things you were doing were more and more heading down that data route or was there a trigger was there a light bulb moment where you went, "Ah, this is the future." Um, well, it was a bit of a combination of both. So I'd been thinking about data for quite a while because I'd been, you know, reading stuff about what other industries were doing and looking at, you know, brands like Netflix and and how they were using data. And, um, and I, I kind of had it in my head that I wanted to use it, but I didn't really know how. And then there was a specific moment um, towards the end of, of, one, of my, one of my roles where I realized just how much we used gut instinct and subjectivity to make really major and far-reaching marketing decisions. And I just thought, this is, this is ridiculous that we do this. It's ridiculous that we put so much on the line, you know, whether that's the success of a campaign or whether that's, you know, the health of a business just on a whim. And so that's when I got really serious about it. But I didn't I didn't really know what it was going to be. And and then I, I spent sort of best part of 2019 just going around and talking to loads of operators and talking to all the marketing directors I knew and talking to all the different tech platforms I knew. And then it struck me that we have all these tech platforms that, you know, are are pumping out huge volumes of of really useful data. And then we've got loads of operators and marketers on the other side. So it's saying, well, I wish there was a way we could grow our sales. And I thought, this is this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to sit in between those two groups of people and I'm going to show operators and marketers how to use that customer data to drive their sales and and you know boost the success of their businesses. Yeah, amazing. Well, I'm, I'm I'm excited because it does sound like that utopia. It does seem insane that we are literally drowning in all this information. But I guess to <clears throat> you know, for people who who maybe haven't given this as much thought, what do you mean by data? Because there's an awful lot of of information out there, isn't it? What sort of thing are you suggesting um, that we should be tracking? Yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it? Because when you think of data, you kind of like you know. I, th- I think people think that I'm like some sort of matrix person that's sitting with a bank of computers with like numbers swimming around my head, just doing data. Well, they things. know you've just got a cat. <laughs> yeah, they know I've got a cat and a, and a kitchen in South London, and that's and yeah. that's basically it. Um, <laughs> so, and and all data is is it's just numbers and and words. But I suppose when you interpret them and when you add context, it becomes really useful information and, and insight that you can act upon. And, and for me, there's a couple of types of data. There's the kind of data that's generated by stuff like social media and, you know, various marketing campaigns and Google Analytics and that sort of stuff. And a lot of that, you know, I call vanity data or vanity metrics because that's the stuff about, you know, how many people are liking a post or how many followers you've got. And I don't really tend to use that sort of data. I'm interested in proof of presence data. So this is the data that proves a person has been in your business and they've been a customer. And that could be that they've logged into your Wi-Fi. It could be that they've um, used a pay at table app. They've maybe ordered a, a meal kit online or they've you know, redeemed a voucher or something. But this data is proving that this is a genuine customer, not somebody who's just interested in your brand, but somebody who has been into your, into your business or engaged with your business, made a purchase. That's the kind of data that, that I'm, I'm most interested in. I love that proof of presence data because I was sort of reminded when I was chatting to, to Lee Cash a few weeks ago from Peach Pubs and he was chatting about that sort of the contrast I suppose between intuition and data and that was much more around when they were trying to find new locations and he'd be mm-hmm. sort of you know parked outside at night on a rainy evening sort of you know counting how many people were walking past and working yeah. out how far away they were from the nearest I don't know car park or bus stop or houses or whatever and and he very much 
you know, could feel it. It was all about intuition for him. And then his, mm-hmm. his business partner was very much about, you know, did you remember to fill in the spreadsheet that I sent you with that actually logged all of these things in a, in a useful way? But even that is, is is data. So for the purpose of this conversation, though, it's very much around that, yeah, that proof of presence. This is people, human beings in the building. That's what we're talking yeah. about, yeah? Yeah, for sure. And, and just picking up on what you were saying there, um, you know, th- there's, there's always a space for intuition because, you know, what, some of our operators are incredible operators and they know their businesses and their customers and they know where they where they trade best. Um, but it's interesting that one thing I see a lot with clients is that we will always have a relatively small group of people in the customer base that are actually the most valuable customers. And they're not always instantly visible. So when you're just thinking about your business and you're looking, you know, you're looking in your in your restaurant or in your bar and you're looking out at who's coming in in great numbers, they might not necessarily be the, the people that are most valuable to you. And that's where data can really help, because then rather than just, you know, finding new sites and filling them with more of the same, you can find new sites based on who are the most valuable people to your business and you're just going to get a much better return on your investment when you when you apply a bit of data to those decisions. Hmm. And is this along the lines of the 80-20 principle then that you're very likely getting 80% of your revenue from 20% of your customers? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's funny, I'm writing a piece at the moment about the, I think it's called the Pareto principle, isn't it? That, that 80% of consequence comes from 20% of action or the other way around. Um, but yeah, that, that 80-20. And, and I see that so often. In fact, there's, there's one brand, and I won't tell you who it is, that I've been working with recently. And they've got um, they've got like their most their most common customer group. It's let's say it's it's something like seventy percent of of their customers. Yeah, it's only it only accounts for about forty percent of their spend. And and previously they'd been directing all of their marketing to let's find more of these people because this is who comes in our in our restaurants, but they weren't particularly valuable to them at all. And then they had this tiny little group who I think represented about one percent of their customer base, and they accounted for twenty seven percent of their of their spend. So if I'm putting my marketing money on the line, I'm going to try and find people like that one percent because that as a multiple. I mean, my God, we'd we'd all be, you know, drinking champagne and then, you know, holidaying in 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 Mauritius if we could get that kind of return on our customers, couldn't we? Yeah, I think we'd take a holiday in Bognor at the moment, to be honest, wouldn't you? I mean, locked <laughs> yeah. up in our houses for a year, but God, Mauritius. I say I'm going off on a, yeah, I was all of a sudden, I was on a, I was on a beautiful sunny beach. Um, so how are we doing with this? Like, is, it, is it the case that the data is already there and that we've already got it and we're just not using it? Or is it the case that we need to be putting some stuff in place in our businesses that actually capture this data? I suppose it's, yeah, where, where are we on this seesaw, I suppose, of, of info? Yeah, you know what, it's it's somewhere in between. So most businesses, if you're using stuff like customer Wi-Fi and, um, you know, things like pay at table apps and stuff like that, most businesses will already have a a decent chunk of data to start with. What I find um, is is two things. One, it's about the volume of data. So typically, I'll I'll go in and I'll I'll do an audit of your data. And typically, you're collecting maybe 5 to 10% of your footfalls data. Um, And that means that you've got 90 to 95% of people that are coming through your door each day, and you don't know who they are, or how often they visit, or why they're there, or or what they're buying. So it's about just increasing the volume. And, and putting stuff in place to make sure you're increasing the volume of the data you're already capturing. And then the other part is about the depth and the richness of data. So, you know, we're always capturing an email address, and that's a really good identifier for me to work with. We're usually always capturing gender. We're usually always capturing, you know, um, age. But age and gender will only take you so far because they're becoming, in, you know, increasingly irrelevant. So, you know, if you talk to me as a as a 46-year-old, 46-year-old woman, you could probably show me adverts for, I don't know, wine and laser eye surgery. And in probably 50% of cases, 30% of cases, you know, a 46-year-old woman might respond to those adverts. But if you get to know that person and find out, oh, actually, they they dairy-free food or you know they only have a dairy-free diet then you can really start to target and and personalize them and if you find out why they eat dairy-free food is it you know an environmental thing or an animal welfare thing or is it a health thing you can target and tailor communications and offers in a way that means they're never going to go anywhere else because you get to know them you know in, in such detail and and that's all the stuff that we need to overlay 
we need to capture stuff like age. We need to capture stuff like location. Of course we do. But we really need to capture the why of what people are doing. You know, why are they visiting you? What are their motivations? What problem are they trying to solve when they're looking for a, a table with you or, you know, to, to make a booking? Um, and, and where are they going when they're not with you? And when you know all of that stuff, then you've got a really rounded set of data to do some incredible marketing with. Hmm. And how much of this is sort of passively sort of, you know, sucking up the data that, like you say, is sort of swilling around and, and already there, but we're just not capturing it very well? And how much of it is is proactively, you know, either putting systems in place or, or actually almost, you know, surveying and asking your customers? Dairy is an example, I suppose, isn't it? Is, you know, how do you find out? You might you might notice, I suppose, passively that they always order the dairy free, but you may not know why they do that unless you presumably proactively ask them. So again, is this a, is this a blend of both? Yeah, I think it's a blend of both. And, and it's funny, when I think back to my operational days, you know, I, I knew some of my customers really, really well, and they'd walk in the door, and I, I knew everything about them. I knew their life stories, who they visited with, you know, wh- why they ordered the drinks they did. But when you're when you're thinking of this for a slightly larger group, once you get beyond, you know, one or, or two sites that you can be in and, and be in day to day, you've got to start doing stuff on a slightly more global scale, because you've got to make decisions, you know, across those across those sites. And, and uh, you know, I always use the expression organize, organize, analyze, and monetize. I nearly forgot it then. Um, but it's organize, analyze, and monetize. The first thing is about pulling that data together because quite often you've got Wi-Fi sitting with the IT department or you've got, you know, pay at table sitting with a commercial department and a CRM sitting in marketing. Um, and everything's just sort of sitting all over in different silos. So just pull the data together, you know, in the in the first place and get it get it organized and, and in good shape. Um, the second thing is, well, how do you how do you analyze it? How do you how do you pull all these streams together and getting that into a CRM system? And that that doesn't have to be an expensive thing. There are some incredible CRM systems out there that aren't aren't expensive at all. Um, you know, pulling it into a CRM system so you can start to build a picture of how people are behaving and the different platforms they're interacting with. And, and all of that information is dropping really squarely into, into one place. And then, of course, from there, it's about, well, how do you how do you use this insight and make it actionable? And if it's in the CRM system, it means you can start communicating, you know, via, via email or via SMS or, or, or whatever platforms you've got set up. But you can also take that data to then power things like your SEO or your paid ads or your paid social or, or whatever it might be. Um, and and in, in lots of cases, in most cases, you've probably already got lots of streams of data and enough places to, to put it and to manage it. It's just you need somebody to pull it together, to make sense of it, to tell you what it's, you know, tell you what it's saying and then say, this is what action you need to take as a, as a result of it. Okay, so how much of this can be automated then? Because I suppose you know I, I, I've got a great example at the moment, just looking at mm-hmm. you know re- reopening my restaurant and and the challenge that we've got because we've got quite a complicated operation on a beach with um, order at table now uh, and and then a, a nicer part of the restaurant where it's sort of you know traditional service, but we've also got a takeout bit and a collection bit. I want to be able to send a text message to people if they want to collect because they're maybe sat on the beach and they want to order, but you can't you know I can't I, I can't get you know, systems to talk to each other easily, let alone if I then say to those systems, okay, I also want you to connect to my Wi-Fi and I'd like you to connect to the social media of that person. How far have we got in this ability to automate? Because, I, you know, you said something interesting that, you know, you need somebody to analyze this and I appreciate we can bring in somebody like you to do this, but presumably mm-hmm. you can't be there, you know, on a continual basis. So the ideal scenario must be, and also just with a sheer amount of data, must be some sort of automation. You know, what's your experience? Is it is it a case of somebody sitting there and collating it? Or how much of that now can be an automated process? No, and can only I, I suppose the big guys automate it because they've got maybe, I don't know, one of the major platforms. But anyway, sorry, there's about 90 questions in there, Victoria. Go pick pick whichever one, know, which, pick whichever which one you want. Pick? Don't mind. I'll, I'll go yeah. the, can anybody automate it? Well the answer is yes, anybody can automate it. And and CRM systems now have have been set up and they have been created to interact with loads of different platforms. So you know hosp- hospitality is really, really good at this and, and there are some incredible systems that as they develop their own systems, they are developing them with the intention of being able to integrate with other systems you know the in the olden days they all just sort of sat in isolation and you had to somehow manage like 12 different systems they're all designed to sort of 
plug in together now and, and play really nicely together now. Um, so if you've got a, if you've got a decent CRM system and you're working with all of these other systems, all of that data can drop into that into that CRM system and then you can use it to trigger stuff. Now, the, the first thing I say is that you need to know what you're trying to achieve. So if you get all that data in one place, you can't just kind of go, okay, well, I'll press a button and it will start pumping out some communications. You need to know what it is you're trying to achieve. So for instance, you might say, okay, we want to start communicating with people who have previously been in my business every 20 days, but we've noticed that it's been 25 days and they haven't made a booking yet. And you could set up an automation to then fire out a text or an email or even some targeted um, social media to just say, you know, hey, it's been a while since we've we've seen you. Why don't you drop in? We've got a really nice new cascale on, you know, that we'd love to give you a try on if you if you come out, come in. And and you can set all of these automations up actually really, really simply. And and I would say that the thing is with marketing and the thing is with data is if it's really complicated, you're not doing it right. Because it should be that, the you know, you've got your strategy, you use your data to help you meet that strategy, and you use your systems to then do this in an automated fashion so you can sort of sit back and just pat yourself on the back and, and tell everybody what a legend you are. Um, if it's not working like that, and it, and it doesn't happen overnight, you know, it takes effort and machines take time to, to learn behaviours and it takes effort and it takes setup. Um, but, but once you've got to that point, those machines should be should be doing that work for you, um, and you should be just sitting back and, and counting your money. To be quite honest, <laughs> so easy. So let's take that as an example because I, I, I've given this example so many times to uh, to various techies over the years. We probably tried this five or six years ago, so maybe we're a little bit early. But exactly that, saying, look, I've got regular customers are coming in. What I really want to know is I want to be notified automatically when that customer doesn't come anymore. Mm -hmm. And it feels really simple. But actually trying to achieve it, because it we're like, okay, you know, do, do they always book? You're like, no, actually, they don't always book. You know, sometimes they're just popping in on the way home for a beer. Okay, well, do they, you know, do they connect to the Wi-Fi? Yeah, maybe, actually, maybe they do connect to the Wi-Fi, but, you know, maybe sometimes they don't. So you're like, well, if they book, it's really easy because, you know, I can absolutely get the booking system to log it still a little bit tricky the booking system doesn't seem to tell me automatically if all of a sudden they don't come anymore then i have to go to my techie and go look can we write an api that links to the wi-fi and the booking system and sucks this out in, in into mm -hmm. the middle and then yeah how about if they just turn up you know have we got some sort of near field comms device that you know picks up the ip address on their phone and then can we do that legally without telling them well, yeah how much of it is it a case of going well i'm only going to be able to capture some of this because yes booking and wi-fi easy other things hard or or are some of these systems now so smart i don't know i'm thinking like you know facial recognition camera when you walk in the door how are you how are you knowing if that person has been yeah exactly it's, it's funny i was talking to somebody the other day that um is installing cameras um that you know it's, it's capturing your facial expressions so we can send you communications based on how happy or sad you were when you left the venue but there's i guess there's two kinds of two kinds of information here there's the kind of information that you can tie back to a person so we've got an email address for instance and we can link all of that behavior. So say if we've got, you know, Bob that comes into your into your pub and um, Bob comes in and he, you know, he uses the loyalty card to keep, you know, collecting his stamps and every so often he books a table. Um, and maybe sometimes he logs into the Wi-Fi and he's bought the other thing online. All of that stuff is going to sort of sit, sit in, in Bob's record. Um, but then you've got other pools of data that you're not capturing. And that could be when people aren't coming in or um, as, as in when they're not they're not coming in via a booking. They're just like wandering in and they're not doing any of those things. Um, and, and so we want to get people leaving us that proof of presence as much as possible. Um, so the more you can do to get, you know, as many interactions as possible gathered and and accounted for the clearer you're going to be on on how often somebody's coming in and and whether their behaviors you know are changing but if you've got their data don't forget you can also still do sort of like blanket blanket campaigns as well so you you will be able to target some people that that you know you know always come in by a booking or always come in and use pay at table or whatever it is so you're capturing every transaction but even if you've just got an email address, you can pump that email address into Facebook and deliver some really targeted social media campaigns just to remind them and maybe put an incentive on there as well. So if they haven't been in for a little while, 
then even if you haven't managed to sort of like get them through one of the other channels, you know, through your through your emails or, or whatever it is, you can still reach them in other places they might be found, like social media. Um, so I, I think I think it's about using all of the different approaches together, trying to get as many people captured as possible. The more transactions and the more people you're capturing, the better. But accepting that, you know, we're never going to get to a place where everybody's kind of coming in and and giving us all of their data. It's not going to happen, you know, probably in the next sort of like five years. And and that's OK, because every step forward, you you know, you take with the data you've got is still going to make significant differences to your business. Yeah. Where do you sit on this this sort of uh, dichotomy? I suppose it's it's the sort of, you know, the, are you an Apple view of the world or a Facebook view of the world, isn't there? Because some people, and I, and I struggle with this a little bit myself, but, you know, if I've, if I've genuinely got a local place that I love going to, absolutely I want to hear from them. And the more they know about what I like and what I don't like and what sort of live music do I want to go to, then I guess there's some benefit. But also actually, you know, increasingly I'm kind of like, you know what, I can, I can proactively look for you and find out what I need. I don't need you sending me stuff. And actually I'm very uncomfortable with the you know you dipping into my private life and you know do I want do I want to know that the manager at my lo- local favorite restaurant is crawling through my my, my Facebook photos and <laughs> looking at my family holiday that might freak me out so what's your experience I suppose of of where's the line where this is where the customer sees it as beneficial and and the business does and when does it become uncomfortable where you walk into the venue and they say hey happy birthday Joseph you know here's your favorite Rioca and they go oh my god you're freaking me out or don't do this I'm never coming back yeah, no, totally. I mean, I suppose there's always, when you know, whenever we talk about data, there's always a huge amount of suspicion. Um, and, I, and I can understand why, because there's so much like dodgy harvesting of data going on. You know, every, what drives me mad is you go on Facebook and people are answering quizzes, you know, telling the middle name of their oldest child. And in what year will your ch- oldest child turn 20 or, or whatever it is? And they're all just harvesting data to, to sell on to, to, you know, pretty dodgy sources. But I believe in using data to give people really, really good experiences, you know, the best possible experiences. Um, I read this thing recently, I think it was 87% of Americans said that they would be happy to exchange data in exchange for personalized and relevant offers and experiences. Um, And this thing with Apple, Apple have always asked if you want to share data. You know, this time they're asking in a much more clear and obvious way. And it might mean that people take pause and sort of go, do I want to do I want to give Facebook my data? Um, you know, and and I can see that that's why that's become a really big problem for Facebook, because Facebook's just a massive advertising business, which depends on people's data. Um, but I, I, I just think that if you take away all the absolute scoundrels out there who are trying to rip your data and, and use it for really sort of like dodgy purposes, that most of us are just trying to use it to give people a really good experience. And that's what hospitality is based on. It's based on giving people the most personalized and relevant, you know, experience we can. And if we can use data to help that along, then then I'm, I'm completely for it. Mm. Okay. You mentioned just now about, you know, the fact there are some CRM systems now that do this well. Are there, are there, are there, is there one or two or three that you're, you're happy to mention by name that really are good at, at, at sort of sucking up and collating this information? Yeah, well, there are. Uh, I just, do you know what? I'm, I'm not sponsored and I, I never, ever take referrals or commission fees or anything because I, I want to pride myself on the fact that I, I, I mean, I work with with any data that you that you give me, but I, I just like certain systems. And um, so, I mean, Airship definitely springs to mind. I, I think what Dan Bookman at Airship is doing is incredible. I mean, he's such a hospitality guy. He knows this industry you know, inside out and, and back to front. And he has developed a CRM system that that connects with everything else and is is just so um, smart and so easy to use. And he's so data focused. Um, and, you know, that that's one of the best systems out there just in terms of being able to sort of like, you know, pull everything into one place and, and track people's behavior and set up automations and, and just really, really help operators and marketers. I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. Um, okay, so, I, I, so uh, uh, I was just sorry about him. But I was talking about, is, are there any specifics you can tell me where you went? Ah, oh, I've got a problem. How do I do this? And then you know that bit of software solved it, and you went, ah, amazing. That's pretty cool. What you, you mean specifically with 
with Airship or CRM. Yeah, 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 specifically with Airship and, and data, yeah, because I'm thinking back to those problems that I had historically you know, when I sat there with my techie and those conversations that I had saying, yes, how do I connect my, you know, my EPOS to my Wi-Fi, to my booking system, to my that, and I, and I, and I just really struggled. So I'm genuinely, you know, not plugging somebody's business, but if they really genuinely solve that problem, then it's flipping awesome. So yeah, were there, was there any bits where you went, ah, yeah, look, it does this automatically, that's awesome? I mean, God, I don't even know where to start with Airship because it, it does everything. You know, they're, they're developing a loyalty app that, again, completely bolts in really intuitively and, and it integrates so well. They've got... Um, a well, hang on, so, so let's take that one then. Let's say loyalty app. Sorry, because you're not, you don't work for, for, for Airship and I don't know them. So <laughs> I'm hoping they're going to phone up after this and go, Mark, here's 20 grand. We love that little conversation. I hope they give me the 20 uh, grand. Yeah. I'm worried that they're going to phone up and say everything Vic has just said is completely wrong and we really yeah. want to distance ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and so I might, and I do have a tendency to do this about, you know, to, to, to get stuck into a detail, I suppose. But let's just say, you know, loyalty, for example. So for loyalty to work, it has to know who the customer is and what they're spending their money on. And on the basis that it's not an EPOS system, therefore it has to link to another EPOS system. So does that mean that it's really good at linking to like, you know, shed loads of EPOS systems? Or is it one of those standalone ones where you have to say, you know, this customer just spent this? You, you, you'll you go back to this in your operational days, won't you? You'll know that if you're on the bar and it's a busy service and there's a queue, your member of staff does not give a shit about collecting data at that point. He just cares <laughs> about moving on yeah. to the next customer. So so yeah, how does it, how does it make that slick and if you don't know don't worry i can move on <laughs> well it, I, I guess it makes that slick because it does integrate with um with e, with epos i don't know which epos it, it integrates with and i don't want to sort of like call any out just in case i've, I've got it wrong and um, it's funny because epos was the the last sort of platform if you like to really get their head around the idea of integrating so everybody else whether it's pay at table or loyalty apps and crms we're all saying how can we work together because when we work together and we integrate with each other it just it, it you know it means we can all go in as a, as a big group and, and people want to use this. And EPOS companies traditionally sort of held back from that and, and protected what they did and, and kept that quite close to their chest. So they're only recently starting to integrate. But but I know they integrate with 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 at least, you know, one major EPOS. And the, the other thing is that if it doesn't integrate with EPOS, there are other ways of getting that transactional data. So, for instance, um, if, if you're looking at something like a pay at table app, um, you know, or, or some sort of automated ordering, then that can be pulling transaction and, and basket data into, into that CRM as well. Um, and then when you think about loyalty and how all this works with loyalty, the first thing you should be doing when you're thinking about loyalty scheme is thinking, what am I trying to achieve? Because loyalty has become like the new website, you know, oh, we need loyalty, we need loyalty. And then you ask an operator, why are you running a loyalty scheme? And they don't know. It's just that they feel that they should have one. So, what are you trying? What are you trying to achieve? What behaviour are you trying to behave? Uh, are you trying to influence and and change? And then, when you've got that, when you've got that idea of what you're trying to change, all of that different information going into that central CRM. So that could be the basket and transaction data, could be the pay at table stuff, could be the the Wi-Fi stuff. All of that is going in to give a, a really complete picture of a person's behavior and their preferences. And then it's a case of leveraging that out the other end through through loyalty. And an airship, I feel like I'm doing an advert for airship now, but airship um, are, are developing um, or have developed a, a loyalty system. So it means they can manage that whole thing end to end. Um, you know, they can capture all of this different proof of presence data. They can they can tell you where you should be looking and then they can they can action it through the other end as well. And whether that's through communications or whether that's through providing um, you know, offers and incentives through a loyalty scheme. Mm, okay, interesting. Yeah, well I, I definitely need to take a look because yeah we, we've been on this journey and and really struggled to get things to talk well to each other and and in, in some ways I'm, I'm doing it now I'm just having a chat funny enough with a, a you know maybe a more traditional EPOS system and going look you know can you do these things and at the very least have you got a really open API because I can get somebody to link stuff together but still so yeah so many of these companies just you know either they have one and they want to charge a fortune for it or they don't have one and it worries me now if you don't have one because I can't help but feel that the system sort of has evolved over so many years that it's yeah. probably just a bit of a mess at the back end and uh, and and it puts me off but yeah I think I said this you know, when we were chatting uh, in, in our brief chat yesterday so I, I wish there was just one 
you know provider and and and, and you know yeah. and it just it just did it all because yeah i really really struggle and and this constant investment in in change and in tech because you get you know you get seven out of ten things working and then the, 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 those last three that it can't do become increasingly important because you tick off the, the last seven. You think, oh, man, I really, you know, I really want to do this thing now, this, you know, who's coming, when, you know, let me know. And you go, look, that's the one it can't do. And now I've got to invest in another bit of tech and then all the APIs need rewriting. So I guess it's such a fast paced, fast moving. I suppose a new social media comes along, isn't it? You know, TikTok pops up or whatever this one is now, Clubhouse or something. Yeah. Isn't it? And, yeah. uh, and you think, ah, how do, I, how do I link to that? But I do think the advantage there is that, yes, if there are companies that specialize in their niche and and then it's their responsibility i think i've learned this over the years i think I, at one point i wanted to you know distill our own gin and brew our own beer and roast our mm-hmm. own coffees and then i go you know what let's just collaborate and, and maybe now we're in this period of collaboration where we go right you do your niche you do epos you do crm you do social media you do your bit but if we all open it up in a in a you know in, in an api version it's just taking me back to the beta max vhs wars but i'm showing my age now victoria where am i going with this <laughs> i don't know I'm, i can't no. wait to find out what do you prefer vhs okay yeah B- <laughs> british and they have gone under i've completely <laughs> completely lost it right you talk about personalization quite a lot I and, and i don't what do, you do. Mean? you do and 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 what so what do you some other examples you, you gave the example of dairy but have you seen some people doing this well because it's all well and good you know we take it all okay we've got an automated system we now know that we've got this amazing crm but who, who's doing this well who is doing some stuff where you go yes that is awesome that's why we should be doing this okay well you know what personalization is something that i am extremely passionate about um you know we live in the era of personalization and long before covid happened to us um things had already changed forever and i'm not sure that we really realized that things had already changed so if if you think about it, even the last sort of 20 years of of hospitality the 90s the early 90s when i started i remember there being like a real big you know, flood of innovation and loads of really interesting brands. And it was all about choice and innovation and some really incredible brands popping up. Then you get into the 2000s and it became much more online. And so it really sort of, you know, put the the control, I, I guess, or the power with the customer because they could decide in real time where they wanted to go because they could access your websites and have a look at your menus and have a look at your offers and decide, you know, where do I want to go and, and make those choices? And that was something that really started the whole sort of voucher economy. Then you get the dawn of sort of social in like the 2010s. And that was really kicked off by Instagram about 11 years ago. And, you know, people wanted to eat and drink, um, but they wanted it with bells on. You know, they wanted a menu that was shaved into the side of a dog or, or something. And they wanted the food to come out in a Wellington boot um, because they wanted to pick up their phone and, and stick it online. But the millennials, you know, and by millennials, I only mean an age group. They're not a type of person. It's just purely a group of of people in a certain age group. Those millennials that drove that experience economy are turning 40, you know, and we still think of millennials as being, oh, those pesky millennials and their avocado. They're turning 40 now. And we've got Gen Z firmly in control. And Gen Z is only an age group. It's like 18 to 25 but they account for about 40% of the market. And that's not even including all of the older groups that, you know, that that they influence. I've got a 22-year-old daughter and she says, we're going somewhere for lunch, but that's where we go. And I just kind of follow her with my bank card. Um, so personalization is, is something that this group of people are used to. They've been used to it. They're digitally native. They've grown up. They don't remember a time when they didn't have smartphones. They don't remember a time before... Um, you know, stuff like Netflix and, and Spotify and, and all of the big social media channels. And, and so we have to sort of like find them where they are and give them what, what, they, what they want. So in, in terms of brands that are doing it really, really well, um, you know, I, I think of something like Netflix straight away because, you know, Netflix have just got it nailed. I mean, they are using data to de- deliver the level of personalization which is just insane but it really enhances that that customer experience and keeps it coming back um for more i mean I, when i think of netflix i think of like the crown and you know tiger king and stuff like that but that's that's the front end what what's actually going on behind the scenes is netflix is building a profile about me 
from everything from how long it takes me to watch something, you know, how many episodes I do in one sitting, how long I leave something on pause. They even take little screenshots of what you've left on pause. So that's one to know just in case you're pausing anything dodgy. Um, And they even know when you're most likely to lapse and, you know, abandon your subscription so they can swoop in and take immediate action to, to, to avoid that. And all we see is great show after great show. My God, Netflix, don't they do some incredible shows? But the data and the, the use of the data that's going on behind the scenes is, is incredible. Um, and then you look at Susan. Go on. Yeah. So only, only, only to sell Netflix, sorry to interrupt and, and remember you're on supermarkets because I do that. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel when I go onto Netflix, and maybe it's because I'm in a family of four and everybody hammers it, although we've all got our own profiles, but I don't mm-hmm. feel like I go in and it says, you know, hey, Mark, you know, hey, look, it's, it's Wednesday and, you know, you love this show on a Wednesday. They're certainly not freaking me out, but I don't, you know, I don't, I, it's interesting that they're capturing it all, but I wonder if they've worked out how to use it yet and what to do with it. I, I appreciate that presumably your recommended shows must be one example, but I, I, I'm trying to think of how else, I don't know, you know, they don't say, hey, Mark, you know, why don't you go for a walk down the beach today because you've watched too much TV and we know you get a bit cranky and start watching yeah. utter shit if you haven't been outside. You know, I'd love that. In fact, I remember having a debate with Sky once when they phoned and asked me to um, renew my subscription and I said no and they asked why and it says because I live by the beach and you know i'd rather go to the beach and he couldn't get his head around the fact that the beach was more interesting than sky but i've gone off on another tangent so i suppose <laughs> yeah they're collecting it but have they worked out have they worked out how to use it have they done something that impressed you where you went ah god they know me well um I th- do, do you know what is i think this is the beauty of a company like netflix in that you don't really know how it's working you just know that i, I just know that when i go into netflix i will be greeted by a load of things that i think i like the look of that and even if i don't like the look of it in this moment and i don't necessarily want to have it you know watch it now i know that it's kind of broadly within what i would be interested in you know and it's and the fact that i don't know how it's been done and it's not really obvious it shows just how seamless and and perfect a situation that is because the stuff that's going on behind the scenes is incredibly complex you know they they are one of the most customer focused um businesses ever in fact the way that netflix works is if even if you're working in, you know, if you're working in accounts or you're working in marketing or you're working in product development or or whatever it might be, you are all literally working on exactly the same project at the same time. A bit like, you know, when was it JFK went into NASA and, and spoke to the janitor and, and said to the janitor, what do you do? And the janitor said, I help put people on the moon. They have exactly the same mindset. It is all about the customer. Um, and and I don't ever look at Netflix and think this is all getting a bit freaky. The stuff they know about me, but they must know me inside out because I'm yet to I'm yet to switch Netflix on and think why have they put that on there? I wouldn't watch that in a million years. And and bearing in mind the nuance of TV programs of what you might want in a certain moment or you know what you respond really well to or what's going on out in the the world or the mood you might be into. They're using all of that data. You know if if I watch half an episode or something and then come back to it, they know I'm not in the mood for that kind of program. So they're going to mm. start serving me alternatives, um, you know, to get to a, we know she's in this mood, right? She's feeling like this. This is the stuff that we should be serving her. Um, well, and the, well, at the, the very least, I think you should, you, yeah, well, you should be able to put Airship up against Netflix now in the negotiations for your bonus. <laughs> yeah. I think, the end of this, okay. I'm not sure which one you love the most, but I've got a sneaky idea. <laughs> so. yeah, do you know what? I feel like you know the other CRMs are available, and and many of them I absolutely <laughs> love, um, including Actiol and Sprout Send. I've got to get those in there as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, Netflix are incredible. Then I, I look at supermarkets. So I mean, supermarkets to me are a marvel. You know, they are gathering data at every step of the journey. If when you think about, you know, you go in and you get the little handheld gun, okay, and um, they're probably using that information to work out your route round a shop and where you go first and how long you're in there for, you know, your dwell time. And that, I mean, they're gathering data, they know your, pre- your preferences, they know your pricing sensitivities, you know, which brands you're really loyal to, which brands you can be turned, you know, if they've, they've got a decent offer. They know your insecurities because they know what you're buying. They know your aspirations, how many sort of like, you know, finest meals you're you're buying. They basically know your hopes and and dreams. Um, And there was an incredible program on uh, a couple of Christmases ago. And it was about the Christmas advert that Sainsbury's do. And they had all these people sitting in a room wearing like special sort of 
boffy in the hat, so sort of like tied up with electrodes and stuff. And they showed them the Christmas advert that year and they were measuring people's emotional response to that advert and taking the data of that because Sainsbury's knows the more emotional the advert, the higher the sales are going to be. Um, so this stuff this stuff is not happening by accident. They're not just sitting there going, let's just do a really moody advert. You know, that they know exactly what they're doing and what they're what they're trying to achieve with it. Um mm. so you know, super, supermarkets are incredible. And when you think about loyalty cards, um, you know, and you, I mean I'll call out Tesco Club Card because it, it was a genius idea. And and Edwina Dunn and Clive Humby, who who created the, the Tesco Club Card were absolute geniuses and, and pioneers and, and icons in you know in the in the data world. They're they're not using data um, and and loyalty to. I suppose it's less about giving customers stuff to stay loyal to us, and it's more about showing customers we're loyal to to them. We're loyal to you because we couldn't do without you. Um, which really is quite a nice message, actually, because you're, you're making it all about the customer again, which really fits nicely with with um, with hospitality. Um, but you know, when you when you think about what businesses within hospitality are, are doing it really well, you know, I, I think McDonald's they must be collecting an absolute ton of data from from those screens. Um, and if they're not, then I don't know why not, because they could be collecting all sorts of presence data. They could be collecting, you know, basket data. So we've got product preferences and 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 stuff like that. Um, you know, there's, there's loads of stuff that they could be collecting. Um, but also some of my clients, many of my clients actually, are, are making really great strides in their own data journeys. I've got two brands at the moment who are moving to a completely digital model uh, model for reopening um, because they're trying to use their data to to move people in a very proactive and and you know definite way along the value chain get them to make that one more purchase get them to spend that bit more money get them to you know get their lifetime value to to be as long as possible um can, and, can you talk about that so when, when you say about opening you know reopening digitally can you say what you mean by that i mean I'm, i don't know if you can mention who it is and give a bit of detail if you can't don't worry talk around it but yeah what, what do you mean by that yeah, I, I won't. I won't mention who it is, just because they might give me a massive telling tell off when I come off the phone. Spoiler alert or something. Um, but there's there's a, a grab and go brand, for instance, who um, who has a number of a large number of shops, and they are realizing that you know the world is changing. They want to achieve personalization, and they want to be in control of that whole that whole sales process. So they're going to have shops because obviously there's always going to be footfall and there's always going to be people going in the shops, but they're going to move online to, to an app, um, which means that when they get people signing up to that app and, and looking, they're, they're able to collect the data of what people have been looking at and you know didn't order what people looked at and did order they can be really sure about you know the frequency of of their of their visitors you know and and um the recency and how loyal they are across their estate not just in in one particular one particular location i suppose if you go into one particular location that could be convenience it could be the one next to your office or the one next to the station if you go into two or three of that that brand that means you must really like them. So it's getting a real idea of how loyal you are to them. Um, and then it, it's using all this data to sort of like say, okay, well, first of all, we're going to take what we know about these really valuable customers and use that to find new customers. So that's your acquisition strategy sorted. How do we convert the ones we've got? How do we get them to become more valuable? Well, let's let's use what we know about them from the data from their app to, to push them along and get them to spend more money or, or, or buy things more frequently. And then let's monitor the frequency with which they use it. And the slightest indication we get that actually they're starting to lapse, let's sweep in and make sure that they don't. Um, and and that is, is really, really powerful. And it kind of puts them in line with an e-commerce business, um, which which to me is the is the is the way to think about you know, because in hospitality, we're selling, we're selling stuff, we're still selling stuff, we're still selling food, and we're still, you know, selling experiences, but we can have a much more e commerce mindset to it, and and be really proactive about about pushing people along that value chain. Okay, so if you're 
um, speaking to a client, or let's just say you're giving some advice, you know, lots of people listen to this, have existing hospitality businesses, but there might be some thinking of getting into the industry. But let's, let's say you've got an existing business, you know, it's you are getting excited, we're about to reopen, it's it's ticking along reasonably well, um, but they've not really considered this this sort of data thing. What, what should they be doing? What advice, apart from obviously picking up the phone and calling you and, and having a meeting, what sort of stuff could they proactively be doing now as they get ready to reopen, you know, systems? What stuff should they be putting in place that will make, you know, the, the, the fast the some biggest difference to their business so i keep hearing a lot about this thing the roaring 20s so um you know when when the restrictions are lifted probably in june when it all goes absolute sort of like you know wild we're going to experience could be days could be weeks could be months you know a period where people are going to be you know out and about and and dining out and drinking out a lot more than than they have been for a long time and so with huge volumes of people going through your door you you must not get carried away with oh this is how it's going to be because the economic realities are going to start kicking in and things are going to are going to peter out but while you've got those people capture as much data as you humanly can from them um, because once you've got them, once you've got them opted in um, and sitting in your CRM, we can start to add to, and we can start to learn, and we can we can start to use it. So capture it while it's there. Um, I think um, I, I did a piece of work. Is God, it's Airship again. They better pay me for this. Um, I did a piece of work with with them during Track and Trace because they they run a Track and Trace app, and we saw that eighty eight percent of the of the of the CRM signups of the database signups during September had come through Track and Trace um, last year for a particular brand. So it's a really powerful way to get people signed up, you know, to, to hear more from you. And then we've got them in the system. We've got them and we can start we can start building from there. Um, and this, the second thing I'd say is, you know, it's really tempting to look at vanity metrics. You know, how many likes did a post get? You know, how many people we've got on a database and stuff like that. But that stuff is, it's nowhere near as important as gathering information around behaviours and getting to know them. So if you haven't already got, a, you know, a customer Wi-Fi system, then I'd really consider getting one because it's such a good such a good driver of data. And if you have got one, have you got it set up to capture data? Because so many times I'll go into a place and they just say, oh, yeah, put this code in. No, put my email address in to access it because then you're capturing my data. You know how long I'm visiting and, and when I come back, for instance. Um, so things like stuff that, that's there to sort of like gather that stuff. Um, and we're also trying to gather, you know, the stuff about them, their age, their gender, their likes, their dislikes, and their motivations, for instance. So I'd say that anything from Wi-Fi to get your promotions, you know, get get make them el- electronic, stop doing those, you know, 50% off, just hit a button on your till things, set up code, you know, it's really worth the investment in buying the digital codes because the data that you get back and also the the fraud that you avoid, it pays for itself. And stuff like pay at table, you know, um, I, I think customers customers welcome stuff like the pay at table. And I was talking to Dan Hawkey at, um, at Feed It Back a, a little while ago, and we were talking about this, and he was pointing out that McDonald's have done a blinding job in getting people to, to order their own food on those screens. Because what they've done is rather than just cut back that money and said, well, that's it, we don't spend, we don't need to spend as much money on counter staff anymore, they've reinvested it in people bringing food to your table. So you've got this really perfect system where you go in and because you're ordering your own your own meal, you will spend more money. You know, I'm I'm yet to find a pay at table app that doesn't generate a higher average order value than than just a you know a, a way to customer um interaction. So you, you're generating a higher order value. The person goes and sits down and then you can layer on all that extra hospitality, you know, by delivering it to the table, by just really enhancing the atmosphere and, and the chat and all of the stuff that we're, we're really good at. Um, and this stuff isn't hard to get in place. I mean, we, we, saw, we saw how fast this industry moved when, when lockdown happened and the first sort of like sniffs that we could reopen you know, were were starting to be felt. We can turn this stuff on really quickly, and and the tech platforms themselves, it's what they do. You know, they they it's what they're set up to do. They can get you motoring really quickly. So if you're not collecting data now, if you're not at if you if you don't know who your customers are now, and you're not collecting data now. I would suggest that you need to put that in place. You've got a few weeks left to get that organised, and then when you open the amount of data that you'll be able to capture and the stuff you'll be able to do with it afterwards 
will more than pay for any investment that it's it's taken to get that to get those systems in place perfect okay that sounds good um we need to start drawing to a close sort of conscious on timing but before we do then so thank you you know amazing and i think hopefully you've motivated lots of people to at least think about this just going back a little bit to your personal experience i mentioned at the start of this you know tough time to launch a business literally just before the pandemic what's your experience been i suppose a a a client a clientele kind of you know have they spent this time purely in survival mode and battening down the hatches or actually have they been sort of you know looking up above the parapet and going you know what this is a time to get organized and and yeah what's your experience been i suppose of the the early days of a business and the challenges of doing that in a pandemic do you, do you know what? It's been a really mixed picture, and there's been a there's there's been a, a section of the industry who have just said, you know what, that we we know data is a thing. We we can see that other industries are way ahead of us. We're going to spend the time and and do this now, and they're going to be opening from such a strong place because we've spent these last few months, you know, putting put in these systems in place, gathering the data. They know who their most valuable customers are. A lot of brands don't know who their customers are, full stop, let alone who their most valuable customers are. So they're going to open with really strong, knowing exactly who they want to be taking up their, you know, their seats when we reopen um, and and they're ready. They're, they're braced and ready to go. So then there's a second type of person and, and or, or operator. And I think this is the type of operator that are waiting for something to happen, you know, waiting for Eat Out to help out. They've probably been paralyzed by fear for the for the last few months, not wanting to make a move, not wanting to spend any money, understandably so, like completely understandably so. But I think I think those operators are waiting for something to happen. They're waiting for another Eat Out to help out, or they're waiting for some amazing weather to to kick off you know to to flood our beer gardens in april or um you know or, or just the roaring 20s to actually you know materialize and uh, and i fear for these operators because because they're not in control of their businesses you know and and i would strongly urge those people to be sort of sitting going i want to i want to be in control and data and personalization puts you in control of your business and it's not too late to start making those those steps and it's not as it's not as big a project as as you think it might be, and it's probably nowhere near as expensive as you think it might be either. So those are the people that I would I would just really urge to sort of go enough enough of waiting for stuff, enough of you know being at the whims of the economy or how well the England team are doing or what the weather's like or whatever it is. Use data to drive personalization. Um, you know, personalization is where we're at. Personalization is driven by data. And and that's going to help drive business success, and I can I can help you with that. Okay, amazing. So you're you're about to be uh, very busy, hopefully. Um, you you wrote a blog. So just just to close, just look at the future. You wrote a blog in June 2020 about the casual dining being in choppy waters. I've spoken a lot about it on on this podcast because um, I think you know this this started a couple of years ago, so yeah. pre pandemic, and we were already having challenges you know with oversupply in the market and and price competition and vouchers and you know odd pizza companies being bought out by chinese venture capitalists who arguably Mm -hmm. maybe don't have you know real true hospitality at the heart of what they do so you know there was shortages of chefs there were lots of issues around the sector little did we know that we'd look we had brexit i suppose little did we know we'd look back on those days fondly and go oh my god wasn't it all golden times eh? golden times yeah what's your thoughts as to how we come out the other side of this for the industry do you see a lot of people you know, not not reopening. I suppose. Do you think this is going to be a golden time for for what we do? Have people fallen back in love, maybe with their local boozer? I don't know. Any any general thoughts? I suppose on post pandemic hospitality compared to those choppy waters before. Um, I, I think I think many of the same issues will will still remain, and and I think it's now about how we how we wake up to the realities of of what the rest of the world is doing. Um, I mean, I, I said this to you yesterday that. The, the thing that I love about hospitality, everything I love about hospitality, the fact that you can start, you know, work in the bar and end up as the marketing director, all of that stuff is is amazing. And it, this is what we're good at. We're energetic. We're people, people, you know, we're hospitality people. But this is the very sort of, you know, set of behaviors that could set us up for failure in the future, because the world is looking for more than that. And what we need to do is underpin our businesses 
knowing that you know personalization and data are are the drivers now they are the drivers and we don't know who our customers are because most of us aren't gen z you know we can't identify with their lives so we need to make sure we're collecting data to enable to do that and then over the top of that we overlay the passion and the innovation and the energy that that this industry is is really famous for and then i think then i think we can win um and i think the other thing is as well is that you know, so so many of us in hospitality, we're hospitality lifers. You know, it's all we've ever known. And I think we need to take a massive glance outside of our industry and see that we're 25 years behind retail um, in terms of our understanding of our customers and how we how we leverage that information. And retail aren't even that amazing at it, you know, and we're 25 years behind. So I think we need to start being really honest with ourselves about how we how we, you know, run our businesses. And how we do our marketing particularly, because, you know, operations, operations spend a huge amount of time looking at data and marginal gains and tweaking 1% here and half a percent there. And I, I think we need to start taking marketing in particular, you know, a lot more seriously as a as an industry, because marketing, marketing have got so many of the answers to the to the questions that we're struggling with, you know, how to get more people in there, what do people want, who are our most valuable people, where should we be opening, where where shouldn't we? Um, and and I think I think it's going to change take a fundamental change in the way that we run many of our hospitality businesses because I've sat on, I've sat on, you know, many a board, and I've seen how we make some decisions. And quite frankly, it's it's astonishing some businesses are still in business at all. You know, the way we the way we make decisions. So I think we've got to be really honest. Um, and in terms of what what happens next, I, I think unfortunately we're going to we're going to lose many businesses who maybe weren't viable before. Um, I think tragically we're going to lose many businesses that probably were very viable before, but just have ran out of of money and energy. And I think I think the industry will grieve for all of those businesses that you know really really were just great businesses until COVID came along. But but like any any drop, we're going to start see, seeing that sites are going to start reopening again. We're going to see you know interesting people buying interesting sites, trying new concepts. Our, um, and and I think I think eventually we'll get to another another golden age, but we can't keep doing things how we've always done it. Those those times are well behind us now, and we we really need to approach hospitality very very differently to to guarantee its survival beyond the next five or ten years. Okay, well, there's a good call to action for everybody to take this seriously. If Google ever do, a, I think they, they do this now, they look at the transcripts or whatever, work out voices, they will never have seen a, a podcast that used the word data more than this one. So you're going to go down in hospitality <laughs> data history, uh, Victoria. But I think, you know, thanks for banging the drum and bringing it to our attention. I do agree with you. And and, I, and I'm kind of excited because I got a little bit disheartened with trying to do this maybe a little bit ahead of our time, sort of six six years ago or so, mm-hmm. and, and it just being too hard. But I do think that this collaborative age you know creates a unique opportunity where we can do it better and do it for the good of the customer personalization journey you know let's not be sending pictures of steaks and two-for-one offers uh to to you know vegans and let's not be yeah sending pictures of milky cow cappuccinos to uh people with a dairy intolerance so i think you know i think we get this right and it can be really really good where should people go if they want to follow you and your journey or the business do you have a personal as well as business social or is it all via data hawks what's what's the address and what's the best social channel to go to well, um, first of all, the website, uh, wearedatahawks.com. Um, I'm usually found on, on LinkedIn, sort of um, having strong opinions on stuff. Um, so I've got my own LinkedIn, Victoria Searle, or there's a Data Hawks one. Um, and you can find me on Twitter as well. And I think it's just Victoria Searle on, on Twitter. And I'm, I'm usually on there having very strong opinions about data and all sorts of stuff on, on there. Um, but yeah, just, just give me a shout. I'd really love chatting to people about this sort of stuff um anything i can do to help please don't hesitate to give me a shout amazing perfect all right well i will put links to all of those uh sort of points on the show notes that go with this as well on the website humansofhospitality.co.uk but for now you know thank you so much you can get back to uh deciding whether you want to let that stray cat in or not and eat your cat (laughs) breakfast and uh and and i better get to work but really appreciate you taking the time victoria and if you're ever in bournemouth uh, pop your head in and say hello I will. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure, Mark. Thank you so much for your time. 
All right, I hope you picked up a nugget or two in there somewhere, and I'm sure you will be very happy at the very least to go the rest of the day without hearing the word data. But some good advice in there from Victoria. And as I said at the start, do head over to humansofhospitality.co.uk to get in touch with your thoughts on any software or questions around this topic. It is always good to hear from you as a listener. And as always, if you can leave a review for the podcast on your player of choice, that is super helpful in getting the algorithms to put this show in front of more people, which makes it easier for me to attract some awesome guests. A win-win, I hope you agree. Okay, until next time, thank you for listening. Have a good couple of weeks. Cheers.